Welcome to the Mama Stay Fit podcast. Today's episode is going to be Roxanne's first birth story, her birth with her daughter, Lily. Welcome to the Mama Stay Fit podcast. This is Gina, perinatal fitness trainer and birth doula. And this is Roxanne, labor and delivery nurse and student midwife. And this is the Mama Stay Fit podcast, where we empower you on your prenatal fitness, birth, and postpartum return to fitness journey. Our podcast shares how to move throughout your pregnancy to stay strong and comfortable. Pain is not a requirement of pregnancy. Understand the science of birth and how to approach recovery after birth. We share our personal experiences as mothers navigating the stage of lives, plus our professional expertise as birth workers and fitness professionals. Our goal is to help you feel confident as you navigate the perinatal time frame for an empowering pregnancy, positive birth, and postpartum journey. We are glad to have you with us on this journey and that you've chosen us to support you. Welcome to episode three. So we're going to be discussing my daughter's birth, my first daughter, Lily. So I was still active duty army when I got pregnant with our daughter. So my husband is also active duty army and with his job, he does deploy pretty often. So we did try to plan our, we knew we wanted to get pregnant shortly after our wedding and we wanted to kind of plan it so that he was deployed for my pregnancy because we wanted him to be able to be home for a longer period of time when baby's actually here. So we knew he was deploying in the fall of 2018. So we tried to like get pregnant before he left. We were obviously successful at somewhat planning a baby as much as you can. And I was about like 13 weeks when he left. And then he was gone pretty much my whole pregnancy. Thankfully, I didn't have like any complications during my pregnancy that required him to like come back early or anything. The only thing that I really had like pain wise was my SPD pain. The symphysis pubis pain, which is the pubic bone in the front, was like separating and kind of like misaligned. That was causing me a lot of pain anytime I did single leg movements or like open my legs. Everyone that I talked to was like, oh, this is just happens during pregnancy. You just like squeeze a ball between your legs and it'll go away when you're pregnant or when your baby's here. And I was like, okay, like once the baby's here, this will go away. Like that's all I held on to my whole pregnancy. Like I tried to work out through it. And Gina would like come up with these modifications. But as I just got more and more pregnant, it just got more and more uncomfortable. So I did see a Webster certified chiropractor that's here now in our gym. But that at the time he was in his own chiropractor clinic. I saw him weekly and that was super beneficial for my pain. But it wasn't really addressing what was causing the pain. It was more just like treating the pain. As we know now, I would had some muscle imbalances that was causing the pain. So with subsequent pregnancies, I was able to prevent it. But that was really it for my first pregnancy, like complication wise. My husband was able to get home like a week early. So I was 36 weeks when he returned from the deployment. We were very excited. We always joke that he was like a little shocked to see me at the airport when we picked him up because he left and I was like not pregnant, not really showing, no belly, no nothing. I was just like me. And then he came back and I was like very much very pregnant, huge belly. Like Gina and Adeline came with me to the airport to pick him up. And he was like, Ooh, that this is a belly. (laughs) There's a baby in there. And I was like, very much baby in there. So at 37 weeks, we took maternity photos in the town that we got married, which is about four hours from us, Asheville, North Carolina, because we had our wedding photographers to take them for us. So we had to drive out there. My husband was convinced like I was going to go into labor when we were in Asheville. He like packed the car with like water jugs and towels. He's like, what if you go into labor on our way there? I'm like, this is our first baby. We can make it back. I guarantee we will not have a baby on the side of the road of I-40 on the way to and from Asheville. But he was very convinced. So he packed the car with a bunch of towels, some garbage bags, like jugs of water, just in case. And so if you are, we always do recommend this as a good idea because many of us do not know how fast our labors are going to be and potentially a car baby is always a risk. So we do recommend you have like a garbage bag, a Ziploc bag, some towels and a baby blanket in all of your cars, just in case like baby magically comes very, very quickly, unexpected. You have all of the things that you're going to need. So like the towels to like try to sop up as much of the fluids and the baby blankets to keep baby nice and warm. And then the Ziploc bag is really just if your placenta delivers before you get to the hospital, just like plop it in there so that you're not just having a placenta on your car floor. But my husband just got this car before he deployed. So he would have been really sad if we had a car baby. 
really he like drove it around i think for like two months before he deployed and he would have been very sad if we quote unquote ruined it with all of the baby fluid but thankfully we took our maternity photos it was our anniversary weekend everything went fine i obviously did not have a baby in Asheville. And we went back home and just like started preparing for baby's arrival. His team ends up coming back and they're like, did you have the baby? And this was, I think, 39 and a half weeks at this point. And I did not. I was not in labor and I did not expect to be. Gina was 41 and three with Adeline. My mom was, I think, a week late with me. So I was like very, very committed that I was going to give birth late. And my husband and I are both late to everything that we do. We are just late people. We try so hard sometimes to leave on time. We will wake up like three hours early and we will still leave late. I don't know why. I don't know how it happens. People say it's a priority issue and like we don't prioritize being on time. Maybe it's something else. I don't know what it is. So I was like, we're late. This baby's going to be late. And I was working active duty full time at working as a nurse until I was having this baby. At 37 weeks, I was like, this baby can come at any time. I think I'd be okay with it. But around 40 weeks, I was finally very tired of working. 40 weeks before a, I think it was like a long weekend of, before like I worked shift work at the hospital and we worked like track. So we worked Friday, Saturday, Sunday. You were then off Monday, Tuesday. Then you worked Wednesday, Thursday, and then you're off the weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So my shift before having two days off, before having to work the long weekend. And my goal was to not be there for that long weekend. I was determined that this baby was gonna come and I wasn't gonna be, I had this feeling, I was like, I'm not gonna be at work this weekend. I even told my friend, don't expect me to be here because I'm gonna have this baby. It was also, my daughter was born May 3rd. I was like, I am gonna have a margarita on Cinco de Mayo. I'm gonna drink a margarita because my favorite drink is a margarita. And I have not had one and it would be perfect timing to have this baby so that I could be home to have a margarita. I was just, I was determined. And I don't know if I just like put it out into the universe so much, but Tuesday I asked if my midwife would check me before I went home. And she was like, no, we're full. I'm not going to do that. But she did begrudgingly. And I was like, closed, I maybe fingertip. And I was like, could you do a membrane strip? And she's like, I'm not going to do that because there's not going to be a bed for you, Roxanne. And I was like, but could you? And she still said no. So I went home very sad on Tuesday night. Wednesday, nothing, just a normal day of no labor. I was so sad. And at this point, I'm 40 weeks, like Gina's like, you're gonna be pregnant for like two more weeks, calm down. So my due date comes and goes, but then I think that night I had a good cry. So I was like, maybe like my pelvis, like I'm having all this pain, like how am I gonna handle labor? I had a good cry with my friend on the phone. And then she's like, just take a bath, you'll be fine. The pelvic pain that you're having is not nearly as bad as labor. So I held on to that, I took a nice bath, listened to my hypnobirthing tape, and then went to bed. And the next morning, I think it was like 2 or 3 a.m., I woke up and I was like, I'm having contractions. Either that or I need to go to the bathroom. I think these are contractions. I have really no idea, but I think these are because they're coming and going, but they're not that bad. But I was like, this is it. Labor has begun. I got in the bath. I was like, this is great. I listened to my hypnobirthing tapes for like a couple hours. I like texted my dad because I knew he was on night shift. And he's like, I'm going to send your mom over. My mom comes over. I think it's at this point, like, 6 a.m. She like makes me some like kimbap, which is just rice and uh, seaweed wrap. Really delicious. It helped. It gave me food because I hadn't eaten yet since I woke up at 3 a.m. So like she stays with me for a couple hours and Gina finally wakes up after I've been texting her for the past five hours while she's asleep. And she's like, cool, you're not really in labor. Uh, She didn't say this, but I heard it in the nonverbal way she was saying things like, okay, well, I'm going to go to the gym. I think you're doing a really great job. I'll come back and bring you lunch later. And I was like, okay. She's like, maybe try to take a nap. And I'm like, damn it. I knew you were going to say this. And my other friend, I had messaged her. I was like, I'm contracting. And she's like, cool, girl, you need to take a Tylenol and some Benadryl and go back to sleep. And I was like, okay. So I took a Tylenol and a Benadryl and I took a five hour nap. 
Let's take a break from this week's episode to hear about one of our sponsors, Needed. If you've ever wondered what you should be taking at each stage of the perinatal journey, then I'm really excited to share about Needed's trimester plans. Needed's trimester plans are designed for the five distinct phases of the perinatal journey, preconception, all three trimesters of pregnancy, and then the postpartum period. These plans build off Needed's complete plan, your optimal baseline support of comprehensive multivitamin, vegan omega-3, a pre and probiotic, and then a collagen protein. What changes my plans are the different add-ons that are needed by each stage. I love this approach because some products are best taken at specific stages depending on where you are during your pregnancy or in the postpartum period. Needed trimester plans are the optimal way to nourish your body through every stage of the perinatal journey and the best way to save on your monthly supplement needs. To get started, visit thisisneeded.com and use code MAMASTAYPOD100 for $100 off your first three months of your trimester plan. Does this story sound familiar to you? Because this is what my early labor also was like. I wanted everyone else to be way more excited than they were because I was in active labor, even though I was contracting every 20 minutes. I also knew I was in early labor, but I really wanted it to be more. I wanted it to be more. But then, so took a bomb ass nap, woke up. It was like noon now. So it was like five hours later, woke up, no contractions. They were gone, of course. So sad, sad, Roxanne. But I woke up, I felt super rested from my nap and then like sleeping last night. So we ate, I think we had like Panera bread, you know, like brought Panera bread after she worked at the gym and we all went on a walk. My husband did not go to work that day because I like woke him up and I was like, I don't know if you need to go to work, but like, I'm probably not going to have a baby today. Like most likely not going to have a baby, but like just in case, maybe don't go. I don't know. And he's like, I'll just not go. Or like, he's like, I'm going to go and then you're going to need me to come get you. So I'll just not go. And I'm like, perfect. Sounds great. He could have gone to work in hindsight and it would have been fine. But it was nice to have him home just to like kind of prepare and be excited a little bit. I think after our walk, my contractions kind of picked up a little bit, but nothing crazy. So like Gina went and coached her evening class and came back. And I think my husband and I decided we're going to make dinner. So we start making dinner. And this is when my contractions start picking up a little bit is when we're making dinner. I don't even know if I ate it, to be completely honest, but I know we were making it at some point. And my contractions are starting to get more intense where I'm needing a little bit more support with like hip squeezes and things. I have a Siberian Husky. She is now 10 years old. So just prefacing that, she is 10, so still with us. But on the eve of my daughter's birth, she decided to have her first seizure of her life. And I was like, oh my gosh, my dog is seizing. I'm in labor. I'm going to have to name my daughter Nymeria because my dog is going to die on the day that she's born. That is not a good name for a daughter. Like, I really like Lily. Nymeria is not a good name. She can't die. Is she going to be okay? As I'm like freaking out. So my contractions at this point have like pretty much stopped because I'm like, my dog, is she okay? And she like finishes her seizure, like gets up, drinks some water and is like going about the day as if nothing happened. And I'm like... What, what's wrong with her? Why, why is she acting okay? And my husband's like, ah, I mean, it's probably like the vet says it's fine. Like we'll just continue to watch her. My dad was supposed to watch her. No one told him that she had a seizure. So he was like, why am I having to watch her? Like, this is weird. I'm going to go home now. At like 2 a.m. But that's when we told him he had to watch her when we went to the hospital. Because after her seizure had passed and I calmed down, my contractions did pick up. At this point, it's like 2 a.m. I've been in labor for 24 hours. My husband, who has also been awake for 24 hours, is like, we have to drive 45 minutes to the hospital. I would prefer to drive now at 24 hours than 36 hours of no sleep. That's probably a safer option. And I was like, great, I'm really in labor. So this is a great time to go to the hospital. And Gina just supported us in our decision. So we went to the hospital. My mom was super excited. We get to the hospital. My husband and I go to triage. And I will always remember the midwife's face when she checks me. And she just goes, oh, honey, you're one centimeter. But you're a 100% effaced. And I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cry. Seriously. And like the nurse, like I worked at the hospital that I was delivering at. So everyone knew me at this point. Everyone knew what I wanted from my birth, that I wanted to attempt an unmedicated low intervention birth and that I was really excited to be in labor. The nurse who was the triage nurse was like, Roxanne, you're hundred percent a face. You did so much work. And I was like, I'm one centimeter. <laughs> the heck you mean? I've done a lot of work. This is BS. I've been in labor for 24 hours and all I did was go from zero to one. The midwife says, we could do a membrane strip. 
like your cervix is paper thin. I can do this easily. And I was like, sure, fine. I will say a membrane stripping when you're already in labor, not terrible. It did go from one to three centimeters. So I was like, okay, well, I guess I did something for the past 10 minutes. I went from one to three, but still very sad. And then she said baby was like minus two station. So I was like, this baby ain't even in my pelvis. Still floating around up there. So I left very sad. They told me to eat some food and gave me like the fruit from their potluck veggie tray. And I'm like, I don't want veggies. So there are two things that could happen to your cervix while you're in labor. So the first is going to be dilation, which is how open. This is going to be our zero to 10 centimeters. So zero mean the cervix is closed and 10 centimeters mean that you're complete or there's no more cervix left in the vaginal canal to kind of keep baby from coming all the way through. The other thing is going to be effacement, which is usually not told to you when you get a cervical exam. So it could be, usually you're just told how dilated you are, how open your cervix is. But there's also effacement, which is how thin the cervix is. So it's a zero to 100% of faced, zero being very thick, like not a whole lot happening, 100% being a little piece of paper, essentially cervix. So there's like no width or depth to the cervix at this point. Usually we're going to efface before we dilate. And for subsequent pregnancies and births, you do this a little bit more simultaneously, but especially for your first birth, you're going to efface before you dilate. Because if you think about it, if I have a really thick resistance band and I'm trying to pull it, it's it's gonna be really hard to manipulate or to change it. And so that's what happens when you have a super thick cervix is it's really hard to manipulate or to open it. But when you have a super thin cervix, so think like a really thin rubber band, if I go to pull on that, it's so much easier to manipulate and to change and to stretch it. And so when we have really thin cervixes, it's a lot easier to dilate it. So if you do go in and they tell you the heartbreaking news that you are one centimeter, but you are super, super thin, know that dilation can happen a little bit more quickly at this point because your cervix is gonna be more easily manipulated. A membrane stripping is a natural induction method, quote unquote, that people will use to kind of help stimulate labor. So what they're doing is when they're doing a vaginal exam, if they can get at least one finger through your cervix, so you have to be at least one centimeter, they put their finger in and kind of like hook it around the cervix and separate the cervix from the amniotic sac, circling the finger around in a circle. It's kind of like when you are peeling an orange and it has like that film in between the skin and the fruit. That film is kind of like what is attaching the amniotic sac to the cervix. If you ever peel an orange like this where you like break up the film before taking the skin off, that's similar to what's happening with the membrane stripping. But when they're doing this, this is releasing prostaglandins and hormones in our bodies to help stimulate the positive labor feedback loop to hopefully get your body in labor. Usually if a membrane stripping is going to work, so if you're not in labor and they get one done, if labor doesn't happen within like 24 to 48 hours, it likely is not going to induce labor, but it is causing cervical ripening. So it's causing your cervix to soften and thin out, which is still a benefit, but most people obviously want to go into labor if they're getting some sort of induction method. So sometimes you need more than one membrane stripping for it to actually be effective. So it's future birth stories. Gina did get like two membrane strippings before it actually did anything. And then in this one, I just got the one, but I was already in labor. So if you are in labor, sometimes a membrane stripping can kind of like push you into labor a little bit quicker because it's releasing like a huge rush of hormones. And that's kind of what happened with my birth is after she did the membrane stripping is around 3 a.m. at this point. So they sent me walking and they're like, oh, just like come back in a couple hours and see what happens. So 3 a.m. happens again, slept five hours in the past 24 hours at this point. I was very tired, but kind of intensify the contractions at this point. So we walk around the hospital for a bit. I think we did some stairs. I was like, oh, let's do stairs. That'll help this baby engage, which obviously at this point, not really true. But Gino's like, okay, we can do some stairs. So we walked down the stairs because the labor and delivery was on the third floor to the main floor and we were going to walk around to the car. The plan was to like just change clothes, like grab a change of clothes out of the car. But I ended up deciding that I would like to try to take a nap in the middle of labor while my contractions were like two to five minutes apart. So I was like, I want a nap. I just want to take a nap. We put the TENS unit on and I did not nap. Gina and Patrick napped hard. I think they got a good rest in for the next three hours. I did not sleep one second. I definitely rested. My eyes were closed and I was just like <laughs> independently moving through contractions, but I would look over at both of them when I would open my eyes and I would just be like, if both of you. 
So our mom at this point is still in the waiting room, like out cold, like snoring, having a great time. So we decided to head home because Roxanne was still not in full-blown active labor. So we had to walk back up to the waiting room to wake our mom up to leave. But so this is like 6, 6.30 a.m. at this point. Labor and delivery is still like super busy. All of May was insanely busy. So it's like 6.30, change of shift happens at 7. So we're walking up there and we're like, well, like before we go home, like we could always just get checked just to see what's going on. And then if I'm not dilated enough, we'll just go home. But as we're walking back up to gather our mother, who's again, the waiting room, there, you, there's no way to turn the lights on. So she's asleep in like the brightest fluorescent lighted waiting area with just a blanket and like a reclined in this chair. So as we're walking up, Gina's doula was actually there with one of her clients. Uh, she's like, oh, how you doing? And I'm like, you know, like I kind of woke up from a, maybe a tiny nap. Contractions are like two to five minutes, nothing crazy. And she's like, you probably should just go home. They're still sleeping slammed in there and so with just that one prompt that was enough for me to be like okay I guess we should just go home we won't go back to triage because I knew I'm not really in labor I'm still early early active if anything we could just go home so we gather my mother <laughs> out of the waiting room and we head back home we get home it's probably like 7 30 at by the time we get home Gina sets me up in the bath and she's like, do you want to take like the Tylenol? Maybe that'll help you sleep. And I'm like, sure, I guess like I'll try the Tylenol. And I'm like, so I'm in the bathtub. As soon as I like get into the tub, I'm thinking like, I'm going to take a nap. Like all I remember was wanting to take a nap. Like I was just so tired and I wanted to sleep. And I was pissed that these contractions kept coming because I wanted to nap. Every time it would start, I would just remember being like, no, I was almost asleep. I just want to sleep. And the Tylenol and Benadryl did nothing this time. I did not get any sleep. The contractions continued to come and they just got worse while I was in the tub. I was afraid to get out of the tub though. So Gina came back and checked on me, I think like 30 minutes later. I think she went and checked and maybe fed Adeline. And when she came back, she's like, okay, well, let's get out of the tub and like, let's get in the bed. Like maybe let's change positions. So we got into the bed. She set me up really comfortable with all these pillows in the super cool position. Well, just side lying, just like comfy side lying position. And I was like, cool, I'm going to try to nap in this position. And then my first contraction hit and I was like, F this position. I don't like it anymore. My husband like runs in, like starts giving me some counter pressure. Gina's like, okay, I'm gonna go because we have this baby yoga class at the gym that I'm gonna like start. Call me if you need something because probably early active at this time. So Gina heads out. I think we might've had like the conversation before she left of like, is there something like you're like afraid of? Like, are you, how you doing? Like what's going on with you? And I was just like, She's never gonna fit. She's too big. I grew a too big baby. She's humongous. Because my husband was 9'9 as a baby. And I was like a little over 8 pounds as a baby. So I was like convinced my baby was gonna be like 10 pounds. Huge. My whole pregnancy. So I just like cry. And Gina's like, okay, she's not too big. She'll come out and everything will be fine. But also I'll be right back. Goodbye. And then left. (laughs) So it's just me and my husband. I'm like screaming for the tens. You know, I was like, please just go get that thing again. It was great. So he brings the tens. He puts it back on me. I think I laid on my side for another like two contractions as he like rubbed my back and told me I was doing amazing as I was just like, (laughs) I'm just so sleepy. I just want to go to sleep. So then I was like, F this position. After two more contractions, I like went and got on the toilet. I just sat on the toilet for I think like another 15 minutes. And I think at this time, Patrick like panicked, called Gina because he's like, I don't know what's happening with her. (laughs) You need to come back. (laughs) She's freaking out on the toilet. So this is like 830 maybe at this time, maybe eight, almost nine. I don't know. I think it was later than that. But I didn't just straight up abandon Roxanne. She did not seem to be in a super active labor pattern. And I went to the gym because we had an event going on. And I wanted to make sure that the teacher that was teaching was able to get into the building and everything. So I went to go get it all set up because it seemed like it was going to be a while. And then her husband panic calls me and I run back to, I don't even think the event started yet. The teacher was in there though. And I run back and she 
she's sitting on the toilet and she's like, I don't know what this is in my vagina. And I was like, is it your baby? And she's like, I don't know. And so at this point I had only been a doula for about a year maybe. And so I had probably been to maybe like 10 to 20 births, not even that, maybe more like 15 births at this point. So I was still learning too. And she was like, I don't know what this is. And I was like, well, what do you think it is? You're the one who's a labor nurse. And she was like, I, I, I don't know. Maybe it's my water. So that's a returning to the toilet. <laughs> so this was the second time I was on the toilet. The first time I was just like freaking out. Patrick calls Gina's like, I don't know what the freak's wrong with her. She's freaking out. I don't know how to calm her down. Please return. Thank you. So then I get up off that toilet the first time. I think I try to check myself, but like, again, labor nurse has left the building and it's just Roxanne. I don't know what I'm doing. My cervix is open. That's about all I got. So I get up off the toilet and then just start pacing my house in like circles. I tell my husband, I'm like, I just feel like something's in my butt, but I don't have to poop. I don't really know. Like, I always tell people that it feels like you're pooping when your baby's low, but this doesn't feel like pooping. Like, this just feels like something's in my butt. And when I do this different movement, makes it less like it's in my butt. And he's like, I feel like we should go to the hospital. I think that's a sign. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't want them to send me home again. It's not time to go. And then Gina arrives as I like sit down on the toilet again. Cause I'm like, something's in my vagina. And I was like, I don't know what that is. That's not a baby's head. I know that that's not a baby's head. One, because my water's not broken, but two, that's not what one feels like. And she's like, I don't know what that is. So uh, can't help you there. I have an amnio hook. Do you want that? I'm like, that's not a good thing to offer. <laughs> no, I do not want to break my own water in my toilet. So I was like, no. And Gina just looks at me and she goes, we need to go to the hospital. Get in the car now. And I'm like, no, I'm fine. In my head at this point, I'm like, if it is my water, I'll just have the baby right here. It'll be fine. I don't want to get in that car. Hell no. We got a 45 minute drive to the hospital. No, thank you. Not like this. That's not happening. Patrick's like throwing our shit in the car at this point. He's like, we got to go. I ain't having a baby at my house. And Gina is also like throwing stuff in the car. I'm pacing our front lawn. Our neighbor's probably like, what the heck is wrong with this lady? She's just walking in circles. I'm literally walking in circles in my front lawn. And I know because we had a ring camera and there's literally me just circling the front lawn. This is like probably around 9.15, 9.30. Finally, Gina and my husband literally pick me up and kind of throw me into the car. We're like, we're going. And I'm just like, <laughs> I don't want to get in this car. Because labor, when I was one centimeter, the car ride was not the greatest, but it wasn't that bad. But at this point, I'm like, the thing coming out of my vagina in hindsight was my amniotic sac. I had a bulging bag of water. So I was likely nine to 10 centimeters dilated at this point. Hitting transition. Don't recommend a 45 minute car ride to anybody because that was pretty bad. So we start driving. My husband probably going like 75, 80 miles an hour. I'm just in the trunk holding on for dear life to everything around me. So she's like in the back of the car, not the trunk. The trunk doesn't have like a hood. It's like an SUV. It was a Toyota 4Runner. So like Gina like just put one of the second row seats down so I could get into the seat as needed, but I really just stayed in the trunk. And then I remember Gina sat in the second row with me to like coax me and like coach me through as my husband is like panic driving. And Gina looks at me and she's like, uh, are you pushing? As I'm just like, I don't know anything that's happening in my body. So if I am, I don't know as I bear down. And Gina's like, maybe, maybe don't, maybe don't, don't help them. Don't bear into them. Just breathe. Let's just breathe through these as we're like 10 minutes into the drive. 35 minutes later of me trying not to have a baby in my car, we get to the hospital. So we had to go through an, a military installation has a gate that you have to show your military ID because you can't just like go on to a military base. You have to like be allowed on them. So I was so afraid. Sometimes they do these inspections to make sure that you don't have like a bomb in your car, like something that you're not supposed to bring. Totally valid thing that they're going to do. But it's random. And sometimes like our car is picked. And I was like, this is going to be the time they're going to fucking pick our car we're gonna need to get inspected and i'm gonna have to scream out the window i'm having a baby please the baby's gonna come out of me thankfully it didn't happen i like worked through this like really quickly in my head and it didn't happen so we get to the hospital and you know i'm bearing down for the past like 35 minutes at this point and gina runs in and gets a wheelchair and i just look at her i'm like i don't need that i can walk like no i'm not getting in that wheelchair i can walk but like 400 meters to labor and delivery. It's an elevator ride too. Like it's fine. And Gina's like, no, get into the wheelchair. It is not that I don't think you're capable, but it's a lot quicker to get up in a wheelchair than you stopping every two minutes to try to push and have a baby. And I was like, 
So I begrudgingly get into the wheelchair because she is making perfect sense. So I get into the wheelchair, sitting there. If you are a birth worker, you know when someone is legitimately like about to have a baby and when they maybe just be in active labor when they show up in a wheelchair. If they're just sitting normally in this wheelchair, kind of a little bit relaxed, maybe like a little sadness in their face, probably active labor. If they are sitting with half of their butt cheek off of the chair, probably about to have a baby. So I'm sitting there and I'm just like, yeah, this feels really weird. I don't really like this. Like I can't really sit comfortably in this. So I'm half butt cheek in the wheelchair. Get up to labor and delivery. Again, work there. So they're like, welcome back, Roxanne. We were wondering where you were. It's like 1030, 1040 at this time. And... I remember the nurse who was a charge nurse, she's like, yeah, they have a triage bed for you available. It's triage bed five. So I literally jump out of this wheelchair and sprint into triage. Cause like, I know where the button is. I know where triage bed five is. I sprint into this room. Cause I was like, I have one minute till my next contraction. I gotta go. So I ran into triage and laid in the bed and the triage nurse, I was supposed to be working with her that day. And she's like, Roxanne, if you didn't want to come to work today, like you could have just told me you didn't need to make this big scene. And I'm like, I better be more than five centimeters or I'm going to be real pissed. And she's like, you are definitely not five centimeters. I don't even have to check you and tell you you're not five centimeters. The midwife comes in, like I get changed my gown and she checks me and she's like, oh, you are definitely 10 centimeters and you have a bulging back. And I was like, great, that's not five. That's all I care about. And then immediately have a contraction and my bag of water breaks everywhere. And I just remember the sweet nurse goes, it's meconium, like super nonchalant. And she just sees this face of fear on my face. And she's like, it's okay. It's okay. It's just a little bit. I'm like, that's not reassuring at all, but okay. So we're texting Roxanne's husband at this point because only one person can go with you into triage. So he parked the car. I went and grabbed the wheelchair or he pulled it up in front of the hospital. I sprinted in to grab the wheelchair, forced Roxanne in it, and then told him to run as fast as he could to labor and delivery as I parked the car. And our mom was also like panic driving behind us and parked. And so he texts us, her water just broke. She's 10 centimeters. He's like, we're ready to go. I wish I had the text message screenshot where he was just like, we're ready or something like that. (laughs) And so my mom and I are sprinting through the hospital. So you run through, you have to go up the elevator and then you run through another hallway to get to labor and delivery. So she and I are just sprinting and she's like, oh no. So our our mom is from South Korea, and so she is really funny when she gets excited with her accent with things, and so... So she's super anxious. I'm trying to calm her down, but I'm also really anxious. And they tell us that they put Roxanne in a room and come run out and grab us. And we all come into the labor room together. So as soon as my water broke, my friend was about to put my IV in and like we were going to sign all the consents. But as soon as it broke, they're like, this baby's going to come any second now. We need to get her into a labor room. So they literally wheel me into L&D, which is funny because I went from triage bed five. I remember this because I went from triage bed five into labor room five. I'll never forget the room she was born in which is it was one of my favorite rooms so I didn't mind being in room five but we get in there and then they're like okay now get into your bed I was like I could have walked here faster than this but I get off of the gurney and then onto the bed and I start pushing because they're like no you can do it but once my water broke the pressure wasn't as intense like I can still feel like I still needed to push but it wasn't as strong and it was likely because I had the bulging bag of water but her head wasn't at that plus two station where you have that like fetal ejection reflex she was still probably higher than that but I was having that fetal ejection reflex initially from the bag of water pushing down at that plus two station and then once the bag of water went away her head was still higher so she still had to come down a little bit so we pushed on the bed for a little bit and then my midwife who had been seeing my whole pregnancy I obviously consider her my friend and my colleague she saw me my whole pregnancy all of my visits were with her and she just happened to be in the clinic that day downstairs at the OB clinic so she was able and it was lunch hour so by the time I got into the room it was like 10 45 lunch hour started at 11 so she's like oh I'm done with my patient so she came upstairs and she took over my care from the midwife who was on the deck As soon as she came in, she saw like baby was like still a little bit higher and she felt a bit of a lip. So she's like, well, like she can continue pushing. When was the last time you went to the bathroom and all of these things? So I was like, I have been a while since I peed. I feel like I need to pee. So she's like, just go on the toilet. You can push on the toilet a little bit. See if you can pee and we'll go from there. So I think I went to the toilet very sad, but I felt a lot of comfort. I was very comfortable on the toilet laboring. 
So like sitting in the toilet at the hospital was very comfortable for me. So I pushed a couple times on the toilet, maybe like three or four times on the toilet. And then my midwife like heard a bit of a, a sound difference, I guess, in my pushing and was like, she just peeks her head and she's like, maybe let's not continue pushing on the toilet so we don't have a baby in here and get back in the regular room on the bed. And I was like, sounds great. I don't really want a toilet baby either. So I get back in the bed. At this point, it had been like 15 minutes that we were in this room at this point. So I was just like, we'll push in whatever way we'll get her out at this point. So I think I was like kind of side tilted. I was definitely probably like on my back, head of the bed elevated, but I was like tilted a little bit to like the left and the right. They were doing intermittent monitoring on me, so I didn't have to like stay connected to the monitoring, which is what I really wanted. Um, I didn't want to have to be like tied to the monitor. So at one point with pushing, her heart rate did go down a little bit more than they liked. So they did have to hold it for the rest of pushing, but I just had to shift my hips from one side to the other. I do remember having to do that and her heart rate came right back up. So it was likely just like positional. But I think total, I probably pushed for like 45 minutes. I feel like 25 minutes of that was just crowning the longest crowning of my life. I remember looking down and like the burning sensation. Like you always talk about like the ring of fire, like push into the burn. And I'm like, I'm pushing into this burn and nothing is happening. Half of her head is out of my body and the rest of her is not coming. I swear. They kept being like, oh, this next one, nothing. I was getting real pissed. And I was like, this is like, Did Adeline talk to her and tell her to put her hand by her face? No, Lily just had the hugest cheeks. It was just holding her in there. I feel like her cheekbones came out. Then she like flew right out. Longest, longest crowning. It was the worst part of pushing. But then 45 minutes later total, she came out. It was great. She got right to my belly. She did have like some grunting and stuff, which freaked me out a little bit because she did have the meconium. So I didn't want to have any issues with the meconium. I just remember like asking repeatedly, is she okay? Is she okay? Like she's making that sound. Is that okay? Like knowing that it's completely normal. I mean, some babies just take a little bit to transition, but they were, everyone was like very reassuring of like, we can make sure, like we can call NICU and have them send somebody over just to make sure. But I just remember like holding her and being so excited to finally be done with labor. My pelvis pain is going to go away. I don't have to feel a contraction anymore. But then just being so concerned because she was making this grunting sound because she had the meconium that just like pushed my anxiety even more. But I just remember like being so excited that she was finally here. I did end up getting a second degree tear, which my midwife was like really surprised by. She's like, I don't know how you tore because you crowned so slowly that, you know, it should have stretched, but it was probably just her cheeks. I don't know. I'm going to blame it on the adorable, adorable cheeks. But having to get repaired, the NICU came. They said that she looked great. I know the respiratory therapist was just being nice by checking her out fully because he knew that I was a little worried. But he was very reassuring that she was fine. My birth photographer was there. She got a lot of pictures of me pushing and then of my baby. So <laughs> that was great. I was really just most excited to like have pictures of like their, like of us meeting her first and like of Gina and my mom meeting her. And it was definitely captured. But the thing with my birth that was, it was a little chaotic in the end. Probably don't recommend going to the hospital during transition and then pushing. It's a little crazy, but it's also like transition is a stressful time anyway. So I don't know if you can necessarily lessen the stress, but maybe like not adding the stress of transitioning from birthing location to that could help. I was very proud of myself. Like I felt so badass afterwards because I was like, I didn't think I could do that. And I think that's like a common thing with people like after they have their baby, they're like, I can't believe I did that. That was amazing. Like I pushed a baby out of my body, literally like a large baby out of a small hole that my body made bigger to accommodate this human. Had I had an epidural, I think I still would have felt that, but like, there's no way to know because it was just the fact that I grew this human in my body and I got to hold her and felt supported by everybody in the room, like listening to all of my wishes. Like before they even cut the cord, she was like, hey, the cord has stopped pulsating. Do you want me to cut it? Or do you want to wait until like it's white? Gave me all of these options, even like after the baby was born. So I like so appreciated her so much. I wish she could have been like my midwife with all of my babies, but it was just very nice to be supported. And I don't know if it made a difference that I worked there. Maybe they would not have been maybe as supportive because they didn't really know me, but like everyone knew me, they knew my name. They knew all, everything that I wanted, like my birth plan down to the T because I talked about it for the past like 10 months because pregnancy is 10 months, not nine. 
but one month you don't realize that you're pregnant. But my care was so much different, even like my prenatal care, because I would just do it when I was at work. Like whenever my midwife was working, like we would just do my prenatal visits together, like in triage whenever it was slow. So it was like very personalized care, which I really loved. Like I didn't have to drive 45 minutes to the OB clinic on my days off, like my limited days off to like go to the clinic and wait in the waiting room. So it was I kind of got spoiled, I think, a little bit in that manner that I didn't have to adjust my life too much to find a very supportive provider that cared about what I wanted. But also I had a very supportive like team, like my nurse was amazing. She's like a super amazing person. I had Gina there and I didn't have to worry about Gina not being there at all because she was not in the army anymore. So they weren't going to pull her away. My parents were there, so like my dad was able to watch Adeline and my mom could come to the birth. And then obviously my husband was able to be there, one, that he wasn't still deployed and that he was so willing to support me in kind of a hard time. It's never easy to support like your partner in labor, to like watch them in labor sometimes. It can be hard, especially like you want to help them and you can't take it all away from them and kind of hold the contraction for yourself during Gina's labor if I could have like taken her contractions and like felt them myself so she could have a break that would have been really awesome but that's like not something that can happen so it can be hard to support and watch them through that but he was great he was himself and that's what I needed so yeah like my birth was what I envisioned and wanted minus the two car rides one would have been fine and I think had I had a different first birth experience with Lily or if I had not been there for Gina's birth, it could have been different. Because like for the past two years before I got pregnant and had Lily, my nursing and labor and delivery care had started this shift of how I was caring for patients was changing from more of just like what I had learned and like a little bit more medicalized to being more like open-minded with like limiting interventions if at all possible and like letting people's bodies and start and like work through labor in the normal physiologic way and I feel like if I had not been at Gina's birth like I would have probably just still been in the mindset of like hey like people go into labor and that's what we're here to help them through and put have just like shown up at the hospital and whenever and wouldn't have wanted like would have been fine with like all of the interventions and like almost didn't trust my body to do it because that's what labor and delivery nurses and providers are there to do is that like our bodies can't do it so we need to help them do it. And had I not been there to support Gina and started working through my own, opening my eyes to different labor and delivery and birthing methods and roots, I don't know if I would have had the same birth experience. I feel very fortunate that Lily's birth was everything that I wanted and that I had the people that I wanted there to support me and that I knew that if I wanted to do something else that they would have heard me and listened to me and done it. Lily was eight pounds, so she wasn't tiny. She did have a lot of cheeks. She was a chunky girl and she had all the roles. So from my birth, we learned how our family labors, that we have very long early labors and very short active labors. We learned a lot of what to expect for Gina's next labor is she will have a very long early labor, likely. And once you switch from early to active labor, your baby's going to be here pretty quickly, three to four hours later. And Gina should have listened to me and stayed home is also what we learned. So what's really interesting (laughs) is we tend to labor like our female family members. And so if you're curious on what your labor may look like, it could be helpful to ask like your sisters or your mom or even like your aunts and like grandmother how their labors went. Because it may be kind of a predictor of how your labor will go. Because even our mom's birth story was similar where she had this longer early labor. And then by the time she showed up at the hospital, it went much faster faster from there because she has a faster active labor. And so we all tend to labor really similarly to one another, not to make a promise to you that's how your labor will go. But if your female family members at all had really fast labors, there's a higher likelihood that you probably will also have a fast labor, which is known as a precipitous labor, which means less than three hours from start to finish. So we have fast active labors, but our overall labor is still on the longer, probably more normal side. 
Other phrases that you may have heard through Roxanne's birth story is fetal station. So this is how high or low baby is within the pelvis. It starts with a minus number. It starts at a bigger number and then it gets smaller as you get closer to kind of the middle of the pelvis, which is gonna be a zero station, which is where the ischial spine is, which is this bony jut on the back of the pelvis. That's the reference point that your provider or nurse is using and comparing it to where baby's presenting portion is. So usually their head. So they're comparing to see where baby's head is in relation to this ischial spine. And if baby is above this ischial spine, they're a minus number. So starting from the ischial spine, it's minus one. And then as you get further, minus two, minus three. At the ischial spine is zero. And then once you get below it, it's gonna be a plus number. So plus one, plus two, plus three. Once you kind of hit like plus two or three, you can usually see baby's head. So you probably won't be told your baby's plus four because that means your baby's head is crowning. Like we know where your baby is. We don't need to do a plus number anymore. When we're pushing, we usually want baby to be at that plus two station, which means they're usually right around the pubic bone area or they're getting ready to move underneath that pubic bone. Sometimes they've already rotated underneath and sometimes they're still above that pubic bone when we start pushing. It does depend on your personal anatomy. So it's not about how deep your provider can put their fingers in before they touch your baby's head. It's more about how deep your ischial spine is in comparison to how long your vaginal canal is. The fetal ejection reflex was also a term that you may have heard Roxanne use, which is this really strong, spontaneous pushing usually happens towards the end of labor. Sometimes the right amount of pressure is being pushed at a certain point within your pelvis. So for her, it was her bag of water that was starting to cause this fetal ejection reflex, which is just kind of like a little bit of grunting with your contractions. When baby is the one that's causing this reflex, those contractions are really strong usually, more so if you're unmedicated. If you have an epidural, I I tend to see that my clients don't feel it as much. They might feel some like I'm pushing, but if you're unmedicated, usually it's a very strong urge to push and it's kind of a company with like a very loud, like grunt moan type of noise. It's very distinct. And so once Roxanne's baby's head reached kind of that like much lower fetal station, that's when like the real, like not to say that the previous to that was not real, but this is when the super strong fetal ejection reflex usually begins. And then usually we see babies fairly shortly after that. As you are pushing, baby is rotating underneath the pubic bone and coming towards the vaginal opening. And then this is when they begin to crown when baby's head kind of hits the perineum. There are things that we can do to help reduce tearing, but usually if baby's position is kind of weird or like sometimes there's something that we can do to prevent a tear. And so we can try to by slowing down how long we crown but your baby gets a big say in whether or not you tear as well. But not everyone needs to tear. Not everyone will tear, but if you do, it's not your fault. So one of the things that I wanted for my birth was delayed cord clamping. So delayed cord clamping is when baby is born and we don't immediately cut our clamp and cut the umbilical cord. We allow it to keep pulsating. The reason that this could be beneficial is that when the baby is born, one, that umbilical cord is still pulsating. So it's pulling about the blood from the placenta to baby because one third of baby's blood supply is still housed in the placenta at birth. So by waiting for all of that blood to kind of transfer from the placenta to the baby, it's giving them all of their blood volume that they normally would have. What it's also doing is it's giving baby a buffer because in that placenta is oxygen. So they're getting that oxygen through their umbilical cord. And by allowing it to continue pulsating to baby as soon as they're born, it gives them a buffer window to start taking their first breath and kind of living outside of the womb on their own without any risks. Because even if they don't start breathing right away, they're still getting that oxygen from that umbilical cord. So it's okay. Usually babies, if they don't immediately cry after birth, they will stay take their first breath within 30 seconds. But if that umbilical cord is cut and clamped, that's 30 seconds of them like not getting oxygen from that umbilical cord. So this could just potentially lead to them not being able to transition as well as when we keep it connected and let it continue pulsating. There are also some long-term benefits of delaying the cord clamp. One of the biggest ones is at six months of life. So for the first six months of life, they're either formula fed or bottle fed or um, breast milk is their main source of nutrients. And our breast milk doesn't have a large amount of iron in it or some other vitamins in it as much as like our normal adult bodies would have. So by allowing them to delay the cord clamping, that blood that's in that placenta has iron rich blood, 
has other vitamins and things that we need. It makes them have a higher level of iron throughout their first six months of life. And there was a study done that they tested their blood and vitamin levels at six months of life. And those babies who did delayed cord clamping had higher levels like vitamin B12, had higher levels of iron at six months of life versus babies who did not have delayed cord clamping. So there are like multiple benefits delayed cord clamping, but that's just like a personal choice that we chose to make. You can do immediate cord clamping and then you could always donate or collect the cord blood to either privately or publicly cord bank. And then this is just placed in a cord bank that you could use for subsequent children or other children potentially. The stem cells that could be taken from the cord blood could be very, very beneficial for both research and other babies that could potentially need it could potentially be life-saving for some other babies. So some people choose to do that route with the cord blood. So you have options. So if you remember from last week, we talked about the different phases of labor. So there's three stages of labor. The first stage is going to be the dilation portion, which has like our early interactive labor. In that first stage, we have our early labor, our early active labor, and then we move into that active labor. So hopefully you remember from last week's episode where we talked about kind of the difference between those three. After active labor, we have this shorter phase called transition that finishes this first stage of labor. Transition is usually you're like eight to 10 centimeters and there's a flood of stress hormones that are being released to one, hype your baby up to then transition to the world after they're being born. But it can also create this fight or flight response in you, depending on usually how you normally respond to stressful situations. So if you tend to be a pretty calm and like internal person when you're stressed out, you will probably be a little bit more like calm and internal like Roxanne was, where she was just pacing quietly in circles and kind of going through worst case scenarios in her head. Or you can be more like me, who's on the little bit more emotional side of things where... I'm usually yelling at people or I'm feeling very emotional, very outward and like crying and asking for help. So there's a different like spectrum to transition depending on how you typically respond to stress. And it can be a really hard time for our partners because it's usually if you had been wanting an unmedicated birth that you start to change your mind and you start asking for help. And so it's sometimes really hard for our partners to see that and to feel motivated to continue to encourage you to stick with your plan. Usually I find if somebody has an epidural, they don't experience transition in that same way unless they are progressing super fast. And so if you get an epidural and you're progressing very quickly, that can be a reason that I would see someone start to experience transition and is usually a clue to me that they are probably getting ready to start pushing their baby out. After transition, we have the second stage of labor, which is pushing. And then the third stage of labor is actually when your placenta is being born, which a lot of us forget also needs to come out of our bodies. But if you're unmedicated, it has no bones. And so it's still a lot of pressure coming out, but it's not quite the same as your baby's head. And usually there's like a flood of relief when it comes out, followed by some shaking, which is pretty normal. The shaking is your body kind of releasing the hormones that it had during labor to make space for more oxytocin so that your uterus can clamp down on itself to prevent bleeding. Thank you so much for listening to my birth story. If you liked what you're hearing, please subscribe to our channel. You can also find us on Instagram at our Mama Stay Fit page or YouTube, or we have lots of offerings online with online childbirth education or online fitness programming for prenatal and postpartum time periods. Very exciting. In next week's episode, we're going to be discussing pelvic pain and pelvic stability exercises that we can do to help manage or alleviate pelvic pain throughout pregnancy. You do not need to be in pain as a part of pregnancy and there's a lot that we can do to find relief and have a comfortable pregnancy into our birth thank you for listening to the mama stay fit podcast the mama stay fit podcast is sponsored by needed a nutrition company focused on optimal nourishment for your perinatal journey use code mama stay fit pod for 20 percent off your first order if you enjoyed this episode of the mama stay fit podcast make sure you subscribe rate and leave us a review and we'll see you next week